Good afternoon. My goodness, all ladies. Just one uh, token male there or two. Right, one at the back. And one at the back. I'm Zainab Badawi and I'm moderating this session on um, something which sadly um, afflicts every part of the world, although in this session we are focusing on the laws here in the United Kingdom, one of the most extreme forms of violence against women, sexual violence against women, of course, rape. We're going to try and unpick some of the, um, the myths and the reality about rape, who it happens to, who the perpetrators are, what can be done about them in terms of justice and so on, but more importantly also an area which our first speaker is going to be looking at, Martin Hewitt, <coughs> Assistant Detective uh, assistant Commissioner, Detective Martin Hewitt. My goodness, okay, you've got so many titles, I can't follow them all. Martin You're Assistant Hewitt. Commissioner at the uh, Metropolitan Police and you take the national lead on um, sexual offences perpetrated by adults. And um, he's going to look at the situation as it is now, but also an area that has been neglected in what preventive measures can be taken so that this... Uh, awful offence is not uh, actually committed. Martin's going to speak. Um, he's our keynote speaker in this session. And then our two other guests, whom I'll introduce in a moment when they speak, will be speaking for a shorter length of time. <coughs> and then um, I'm sure you would all want to um, put your own points of view to any of our speakers. So, Martin, please do... Um, Thank you. The floor is yours, as Thank they say. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> so I'm going to speak for probably about 10 minutes or so and just try and give a little bit of context of the, the police perspective of um, dealing with rape and, and, and more broadly adult sexual offences. I mean the title of the myths, and there undoubtedly are myths, and I know Joanne is going to uh, talk about those um, from, a, from a sort of academic perspective, but I think the reason there are so many myths in play around rape is that it is quite such a complex issue for people to wrestle with. It's a very complex issue for the police service, but I think for all the other agencies that are involved in this and for society generally, this is a very complex area to deal with. And sometimes coming out with um, reduced arguments and simple answers and simple um, descriptions of what is going on is, is convenient for people um, to either make it easier or perhaps to, to push one particular position or another. And it's also played out in almost uniquely in a policing context, in a, in a, in a morally ambiguous um, place as far as, again, society is concerned. These are issues that people and we struggle to rationalise and to debate and to argue. And often when I sit at events like this to talk, it's, it's quite, you can have quite a difficult time with people because there's a very clear perspective about policing. But what I'm really, I guess, arguing for is that we need somehow to change the discussion about rape and move it from the one that we've kind of been going round in circles around and start looking at some of the, some of the bigger issues, some still issues we have to deal with, but issues that are broader and allow us to get to understand the problem. The police service has had a very painful journey in terms of dealing with this, and, and many of you, and I kind of start that journey, I guess, with the, the Roger Grafe programme back in 1984, which if you haven't seen, you ought to try and see, which was probably the first fly on the wall programme. And Roger Grafe did a fly on the wall programme with Thames Valley Police. And one of the episodes was, I think, entitled Rape. And it literally showed the reception of a woman who came into the police station to report that she had been raped. And it was shocking. And it is very shocking now to look at the way that she was treated. It was even shocking um, in the 80s when, when policing was in a very different place than it is now. And it led to all sorts of behave all sorts of changes and all sorts of policy changes and, and, and looking at legal frameworks and so on. But we have continued to move through and I'm sure all of you will have seen over the last sort of 10 days, two weeks, the, the kind of um, storm that we have been in around the report into the behaviour in Southwark um, back in 2008 and all that goes with that. And, uh, and it, whenever these issues come, we get the same arguments laid out we get a lot of the same criticisms. And let me be really clear, that is not me saying that what happened back then was not wrong. It absolutely was wrong. But we've done an awful lot to try and move forward in terms of the policing response. And I'll talk a little bit about some of that as we go on. But I think what we also need to do is move forward more broadly in how we talk about 
the issue generally. My biggest concern is that we have a fundamental gap in our knowledge. We always talk, and every report talks about reported rape, reported serious sexual offences, and dependent on whether you are generous or, or not in terms of what you believe, I think we probably receive reports from about 15 to 30 percent of victims, which means there is 70 percent or more <coughs> victims out there who never come forward to the police, never report the incident or the crime that they have um, been the victim of. And so therefore that is a huge gap in our knowledge and a huge gap in all of our knowledges in understanding what the problem is and understanding the nature and the extent of the problem. And, I'll, and that's really where I'm focused on prevention because at the moment we put a load of effort into how we treat victims, how we investigate, how we work with other agencies and all the stuff that you would, you would know about and I'll talk a little bit about. But at best that is reaching 30% of the people who have suffered a crime and suffered um, what I think is a unique crime as well. Um, it, is, it is a crime that, that is uniquely emotionally and psychologically impactive on the victim and all of those associated with the victim. It's a crime that's unique in terms of its impact on the police service in trying to deal with that and, and deal with the challenges of dealing with those offences and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in, in a moment. So just to give some statistics and bear in mind in all of this my comment that at very best what I'm talking about here is probably 30% of the problem and I suspect it's not even 30% of the problem. But if we look at the last five years particularly, the, uh, the number of offences that we received in the Met over the last five years, so from 2007, 2000, 2100, 2600, 3100, 3500, and then 2600 in 2012. So pretty significant numbers in their own right, but again, probably 20 or 30% of the reality of what has actually happened and taken place in London if the fairly extensive research is, is to be believed. If you take um, the last financial working year, 11-12, we charged 555 people with the offence of rape um, in that year. So you can, you can see the maths when you, when you compare it to, to the numbers that I've spoken about. And just some other stats, um, over that five year period if you aggregate that, 93% of those victims were women. So only 7% of the victims that reported a crime were men. Um, that is increasing a little, but I think if I talked at the outset about the complexity of dealing with this crime, I think that complexity has a few other notches when you start talking about male victims for all sorts of, um, sort of societal reasons that you would understand. And so it's an interesting, I guess, question to wonder what the percentage of non-reporting in male victims is compared to a percentage in, uh, in, in female victims. 72% of those victims over that period were 18 years or over, so the vast majority were, were adults legally. 15% of those were children and dealt with by our Child Investigation Command, and I'll explain about that, but that will mean that that was a familial rape, so the, rape, the, the offender was within, within that family. Some really interesting stats now, I think, again, coming back to the myths and, and what is portrayed as rape. In 51% of the cases, the offender was either intimately or, um, or well known or a friend to the victim. And um, in a further 20%, they had recently met the offender. So in 71% of the cases, there was some connection between the victim and the, and the person that had committed that crime. 47% of our suspects were over the age of 40, and 25% were between 18 and 25. But I think it's fair to say that as that five-year period has progressed, the, the number of the younger offenders has actually increased um, as a proportion. One of the other uh, myths, if you like, that, that is, is very prevalent at the moment is around group offending. And so I more than one offender in, 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 the, um, in the incident. Over that time period, in 6% of the cases was there more than one person there. 5% of the cases was actually two to nine offenders. And in 37 cases over that five year period, there were actually 10 or more suspects present when the, when the victim was, uh, was, was raped. 
So those figures do, I guess, in some senses support some of what's said, but in other senses I do think challenge. I think particularly the, if you like the stereotypical image of a rape being a, a person walking down a, a quiet road and, and sort of dragged out of the bu into the bushes by a complete stranger um, is, is much more rare. But nonetheless, um, I think it just gives you the... But, but just to go back again, and that is only a small or a relatively small proportion of what I think is actually happening. Just to give you a sense of our assets, in London, the Rape Command, um, Sapphire, that was, has, has obviously had a lot of attention, which after the incidents that were reported in the report in Southwark, we, we reconfigured completely and brought into the centre to act as one unit rather than being individually uh, around. And Sapphire's got 526 staff, so it's not an insignificant outfit, 490 of whom are police officers and 36 of whom are police staff who provide a number of supporting roles. Importantly, within that command, 164 of those police officers are the specially trained officers who deal with the victims. So we moved to a position some time ago, and I think we've continued to improve that position, where we have specially trained officers whose only role is dealing with and managing the needs of a victim and taking that victim as far through the system as that victim wants to move through the system. And that's a really important point. And I know later when um, Joanne and Rosamond talk, no doubt we'll get into some of the stats and some of the stats particularly around what's the detection role, the conviction rate at the other end. There's a really, really important marker for me to lay down about us being victim focused and, and following the wants and the needs of a victim. And I am not going to sanction a process that to make another figure look good is dragging somebody into the system. And I think part of the reason that we have a lower reporting rate than I would want is because people fear that if I go and report, then I'm going to be sucked into this process that I will no longer have control over. And if we accept that offences of rape are largely around control and power, then really putting yourself into a position where it's no longer the rapist, it's now going to be the police or the Crown Prosecution Service or someone else who's going to take control of what happens to me. We have got to be very sensitive to that. And that's precisely the role of those, um, uh, the, the sex offensive investigation trained SOIT officers, as we call them, who work and they are the interface point with, those, with the victims. In our child abuse command, which works alongside very much, and as I say, deals with some of the rapes, 672 staff, dealing with offending on younger children, on children, um, and particularly familial offending. The other really key relationship for us is the um, sexual assault referral centres. Um, in London, we call them havens, and there are three in London. And they are the centres that are jointly run between ourselves and National, National Health Service professionals. And that's the centre where a victim will be taken if they want to go, so that we can, so that their medical needs can be looked after, they can also be supported both, both with medical and psychological support and any other kind of support and, and some of the support groups that work with us will work in that environment as well and can be um, called in by that environment. But it's also where we would undertake the um, forensic, to harvest the forensic evidence that we can, we can, which is often what is absolutely crucial to us, us achieving a conviction um, further down the line. So there are three of those in London. Our staff work in that environment. We've trialled and pushed our staff into that environment. And um, around about 60% um, of the people that come to us will come through the Haven process. But it's really important to say that that process is not simply about gathering forensic evidence. It's about dealing with the needs, medical, psychological, as well as the investigative needs of that victim. And we also work very closely with the Crown Prosecution Service. We can't afford for things to drop between us and them. There are tensions there, and there always will be tensions there. And, and some of those are right, healthy tensions. Other are more difficult. Um, but we have to work, and we have to make sure that a victim passes through that process as well as we can manage it. And I've used the term victim focus, but you've really got to ask yourself the question, what does that mean? And it's a nice, easy phrase to use, and it sounds very good, and it is a good concept, but it's very, very hard to deliver in a, in a way that is, is going to be good for the victim. Because I think if you take three people who are, who are the victims of a standard burglary, if there is such a thing, their needs will be largely similar, the impact will be largely similar, 
and, and, and it's, it's a much easier service to provide. Three people who have been raped could have fantastically different needs of the system. It could have a fantastically different impact on them for a whole range of different reasons. So providing that is very, very challenging. But we have to be honest, and when you look at the havens and the process that we go through, regardless of having good medical staff who are trained and, 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 and um, there to do that job, regardless of having our staff, this is a very, very difficult clinical process that, per, that the victim is going to go through in the, in the hours after having been a victim in the first place. So that is never going to be a good experience, or it's highly unlikely. It's going to be a very testing and trying experience. But our role is really to try and make that as least damaging as it, as it possibly can be. So going forward around, um, I think there are four things around prevention. Because as I said, if we accept there's a load of offending going on out there, we need to understand that. And we need to be able to do something to, to stop it happening in the first place. Because I think it's fairly simple to say that everybody would rather not be a victim than have a very good service when they become a victim. And there's, there's four areas for me, and I'll very quickly go through them. Um, one is around how we control and deal with offenders. And whilst people um, sometimes um, get quite... Uh, I find it quite challenging when I say it, I think there are different groups of offenders. There are what I would call determined offenders. There are the person who is going to go out tonight knowing that he is going to rape or intending to rape an individual or an individual that he can get into a position where that's possible. And they need to be dealt with in a particular way and in a much more proactive way that we would deal with any other offender that we know about. And I think for too long we've kept... Um, sexual offences in a slightly different box from where we deal with other things because quite honestly if we had a bit of intelligence that said that we think Jimmy is going to be supplying guns to people I know how we would respond to that and we need to be responding in precisely the same way to someone that we know is a predatory sexual offender be that on children or um, adults but then there are those that I think do not go out tonight intending to rape somebody but at some point go over that consent line and that is, that is the line in, the, in these offences, obviously. And that is much more for me about education and about awareness. And there is a massive piece of work, I think, to be done with men and particularly young boys in where they are at the moment in the way they view sex, sexual relationships, women, girls. And we need to really push that forward and, and prevent these people not only committing a terrible offence against another person, but also put, you know, ruining their lives by committing that terrible offence. And we need to be doing something about that very uh, strongly. We've got to try and do everything we can do to reduce vulnerability. In the vast, vast majority of cases, there is a vulnerability factor about the victim, either permanent or temporary, which has made them the victim in that case. So you can think of people that are, um, people that are in a position where they are being looked after and they are, there is a power relationship there. People that are in a violent relationship are much more likely to be victimised. People that um, have a mental health issue and therefore that renders them vulnerable. Sex workers often have many of the vulnerability factors and are a particular group that we're working really hard with to try and protect better. And then of course you get into the, the vexed issue around intoxication, being drunk, being on drugs and whatever. The point for me is there are things that we as the police service, along with others, can do about all of those things. Young missing girls. Look at all of those cases like Rochdale and the others. The common factor is probably looked after children, probably frequently missing from wherever they're looked after. And of course the point is that's why the offender's choosing them. That's why they're choosing them, because they think they've got more chance of success and more ch less chance of getting caught. So there's lots we can do around vulnerability. There are dangerous places that we can identify, times of day, places, and we need to be doing what we would do in ordinary circumstances around that. And then lastly, we need to get the investigations and the whole criminal justice system working effectively. And I'm sure we can get into that a little bit in the questions because I don't want to go too long now. But the kind of stuff that DPP, the Director of Public Prosecutions, came out with this week around child offending and getting some rebalance. One of the other unique things from a criminal justice perspective around sexual offending, I would argue, is that we put more burden on the shoulders of the victim to carry this thing through than we do in almost any other type of crime that I can think of. And we've got to somehow rebalance that. So in summary, where we need to get to is that quality of investigation we have continually got to try and improve and improve. I am happy 
to say where we get things wrong and I'm happy to take the criticism where we get things wrong. We have done an enormous amount to try and do better and we are doing better across the country but, and certainly in London, but mistakes will be made and we need to be held accountable when they are. It infuriates me the way things are reported and the way incidents that happened five years ago are reported as if they were yesterday and very little credit is given and the voices that are moderate and supportive get drowned out. That's unfortunate, but I, that's for me to deal with. But we will have to continue to improve that. We have to continue in getting the, the havens, the referral centres right. We need to do something, and what I'm trying to push on a national level is about reporting mechanisms. This is not like another crime. We need to find a way of someone coming and telling us about this that isn't a way that makes them feel like they're reporting a burglary and they're going to get sucked into a system, because that's how we get to understand it better, and that's how we get to know what we need to do to stop it. And lastly, we need to get a proper public debate with, which, which recognises the complexity and recognises all those difficult, challenging discussions we need to have, and we need to start having that generally instead of the kind of cyclical thing that we have at the moment where people are marginalised in, uh, in, in kind of where they come from and the same, the same arguments are played out because there is a lot more of this happening than we record and we need to do something to try and stop that. Thank you. Martin, thank you very much indeed for that very clear, insightful and uh, factual presentation setting the, the, the scene for us. Um, I'm sure there'll be many questions that have been generated by your discussion. Well, talking of that public debate, our next speaker, Rosamond Horwood Smart, is a QC, and for 38 years she's been working um, at the bar, trying many cases of rape and serious sexual offences. And I think um, a lot of those myths and untruths that Martin spoke about, Rosamond, do have an impact on how juries and judges decide such cases. Absolutely, and, and uh, Martin and I, in a sense, are, are complementing one another in, in the things that we have to say. First of all, let's, let's start with the basics. What is rape? A person commits rape if he intentionally penetrates the vagina, anus, or mouth of another, <clears throat> and he penetrates with his penis, and the other person does not consent, and he does not reasonably believe the other person is consenting. So, the first myth, rape is vaginal, not necessarily so. This is, of course, a very serious offence. The maximum offence requires the maximum sentence, imprisonment for life. And the view of the courts in considering sentence is that it starts at five years. So, on any basis, this is serious. And by the time a case has come to court, there have, of course, been many months, I fear, often, of investigation, waiting, worrying, and in the case of the victim, all of that, as you can well imagine, is agonising. And when the victim comes to court, he and there are an awful lot of men who are raped, or she, will have to go back through the horrors, the traumas of that incident in giving evidence. And that should not be underestimated. It has been described as a second rape, a second assault. And any judge who is having to make sure that this process is being put before the jury fairly and in line with the law has to bear all the legal issues in mind, but first of all, the real importance of care for the victim in doing so, because if the victim cannot give evidence, there will not be a trial and there will not be a conviction. The myths are endless. You, you've just heard a whole number of them. Rapes do not, in the majority, take place at night, <coughs> between strangers in public places. Rapes, as you've heard, can very often take place between people in a, who are trusted, doctors, professionals. And 
more and more people are having the courage to come forward and to explain what has happened to them and trials follow and along with them convictions. One of the judge's problems in putting the evidence before the jury in terms of the summing up afterwards is to deal with some of the evidence that the jury will have heard and about which there will be stereotypes. There is no stereotype rape, there is no stereotype <coughs> rapist, and there is no stereotype rape victim. The fact that somebody is wearing provocative clothing, the fact that someone has got drunk in male company, the fact that a person is an attractive male, this is a, a, a regular, the attractive male does not need to have sex without consent. Myth. Rape does not take place, so it, we are told, without physical violence. Myth. It does not take place, we're told, if the victim has not been injured. Myth. Any doctor at any rape centre will tell you that in the majority of cases, a considerable majority <coughs> of cases, there are no signs of injury on the vagina of a woman who has been vaginally penetrated, raped. And a favourite, a person who has been raped will report that fact as soon as possible. Not so. For the, the majority of women who are raped, it is a hugely traumatic event, and for many women, hugely mixed events, hugely mixed emotions, fear, guilt, shame, mean that they do not report it as soon as possible, with the endless lead-on complications about <coughs> actually proving where she was, when, and what has happened to her. And finally, in court, a huge amount of pressure is placed on whether a witness, any witness, is consistent in giving their evidence. And a person who has been subject to a serious traumatic event, not necessarily rape, but rape is a serious traumatic event, will find it very difficult to remember consistently what has happened to him or her. And that is because there's been a great deal of work which is now part of the general education of all judges trying rapes and serious sexual offences, which shows that somebody who has suffered trauma finds it very difficult to lay down memory in the way that somebody else who has just seen a normal event will do so. They'll get things out of order and they will forget them. And in the aftermath of a trauma, <coughs> we divide into two or perhaps three groups. The one group that goes over and over and over what's happened to them, trying to explain it, and in doing so, rearranges it in their mind and therefore gets it wrong in some areas. The other group who are doing their damnedest to forget that it's ever happened to them and they're pushing it to the far recesses of their mind, again with the effect that they forget. Mm -hmm. And then the final group, which is the smallest, remembers everything in detail and then has the agony of retailing it all as a witness in court. So those are just some of the difficulties that judges are dealing with and now all judges trying serious sexual offences have very regular training. And that is done to bring them up to date with the latest in research. And there are many academic studies, happily, occurring throughout the uh, universities at the moment. And those studies give judges the information 
whereby they can be alert to possible miscarriages that will happen if juries take a view <coughs> which is a commonly held one but is unsafe and untrue. Rosamond, thank you very much <clears throat> indeed for, for that uh, perspective of, of what goes on in court. Well, you, you mentioned the academic debate that's been generated, and our next speaker, Joanne Conahan, is a professor of law who's contributing to this debate <clears throat> through her studies and her work and um, helping give um, guidance, really, on public opinion on this uh, matter. So please, your presentation. Good afternoon, and thank you for inviting me to be here today. Um, Rosamond mentioned that there is a lot of academic work um, uh, on rape, and she's absolutely right. I mean, across the spectrum of subjects, from the sciences through to the humanities, not just law and criminology, people have been researching rape, and there, is, there are a few issues that have excited so much attention. So in terms of academic research, it's considered a really, really important issue. Martin has mentioned that it's a very complex issue, um, that it's it's, it's, it's dangerous to reduce it to um, simple truisms, and he again is absolutely right about that. And within um, academic circles, all of that work and all that of that research does tend to generate very little in the way of concrete outcome, in the sense that there's an awful lot of going on round and round in circles, and a sense that rape is an intractable problem which no one seems to be able to solve. So when Martin says we've got to change the discussion about rape, he's absolutely correct. And actually, one of the things I think I, I would do first of all, um, and maybe this is something to discuss, is I, I would ditch the term. I would get rid of the term rape altogether. I mean, in terms of where it comes from and the ideological and historical baggage it carries, uh, it, it actually brings into the discussion issues that would be better taken out. If we could imagine a world in which we didn't think through the categories we currently think when we approach issues of sexual behaviour, if we could imagine a world where we simply sit down and think, okay, what do we as a society think is appropriate and inappropriate sexual behaviour, and to what extent should law be involved in regulating and governing that sexual behaviour, it would be very interesting to see what kind of conversation would emerge if we weren't using those already loaded terms that bring the myths right back in there, whether you want them to be there or not. Let me put the problem, the issue in a little bit of um, perspective. The, the most recent figures around sexual offences in Britain came out just a couple of months ago, and they show that about half a million people a year are saying that they have been <coughs> victims of sexual offence. The, the vast majority of those are women, but a not insignificant number are also men. One fifth of those, about 100,000, um, are serious sexual offences. So that is people reporting that they have experienced the, the, the crime, a, a crime, a serious sexual offence. In terms of um, the same statistics, 2011-12 revealed 16,000 reported rapes. And of those 16,000 reported rapes, um, that worked their way through the system, the end result is just something just over a thousand convictions for rape a year. Uh, although as a proportion of those who are prosecuted for rape, that's about 60, perhaps maybe 60% um, in the sense that once it gets into the system and it's a prosecution uh, for rape, then the figures hold up quite well, better than is widely acknowledged. Now, what are these rape myths and why are they important and why should we pay attention to them? There are three characteristics of a, of a rape myth or, or of a myth. First of all, it is a false belief. It's a false belief in the sense that it's not borne out by the empirical evidence. And Rosamond has given lots of examples of that. Secondly, it's a widely held belief. That is the problem with rape myths. myths. They're widely held and they're reproduced from generation to generation. <coughs> so that young people who are coming up today and who have basically been born after, if you like, the feminist revolution, women and men are coming 
growing up with the same kind of highly prejudicial attitudes towards male and female behavior that um, we experienced uh, a generation or two ago. So that's the second issue with their, their widely believed. And the third characteristic of rapeness is that they affect how the uh, society responds to the problem of rape. And clearly, the problem of rape, rape is a huge one. Rapeness seep into the system in all sorts of ways. They seep in through the attitudes of legal personnel, the police and so forth. They seep it in through the, if you like, the dynamics of defending in the courtroom. They seep in particularly through the attitudes of juries and a lot of academic work has been done on simulated jury trials showing how notwithstanding that judges are much more aware of and try to, if you like, um, direct juries in this context that those kind of myths continue to compel and to direct <coughs> how people think. They seep into the way in which young women and young men conduct themselves in ordinary, um, ordinary interactions. Uh, one of the points about rape is it's not just harm that occurs to an individual, it is an individual tragedy, but each and every one of us in our day-to-day -day behavior have to conduct ourselves in a sense to avoid rape. We're always engaged in a process of self-management. And boys too um, have to engage in that kind of self-management as, well, uh, as well. So there are all sorts of problems still with the way in which rape myths subvert the proper response to um, rape and the criminal justice system. One final point to make about rape myths is that sometimes um, feminists are criticised because, oh, because you're emphasising that the police and the judiciary and the courtroom and so forth are so infused with these rape myths, you're discouraging uh, victims from coming forward and reporting. And as Martin says, there is a big gap still between reporting and actual prevalence or incidents. And it is true that, that likely when people um, are aware of these the things, for example, like the report on the uh, Operation Sapphire, um, those really are likely to hugely deter uh, women from reporting. I have to say that from all of the research that I've done, that I would think very, very carefully before I went near a police station if something like that happened to me. So it is true that rape myths can have this sort of bouncing back effect of preventing women from seeking justice. And I think, I think uh, that has to be acknowledged and recognised. And that's part of the complexity that Martin emphasises. I think in the, in, the, in the main, it's bringing people together, it's, it's getting people like Martin um, taking the issue seriously and leading from the, co from the police context. Um, it's, it's also by educating the judiciary and leading from there, as Rosamond has said. But I think the really intractable problem, and I speak as a mother here as much as anything else, is how do you deal with the way in which these ideas are persistently um, transmitted from generation to generation so that the problem continues? And that, I think, is, 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 is your issue of prevention. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. And just picking up that point you've just made then, Joanne, I mean, all of you have mentioned the fact that there are these rape myths. And so what do you think is the main reason why these myths are, are, continue? I mean, you know, Martin, you mentioned the fact that the, the rapist who jumps out from a bush late at night attacking um, an unknown female is, is a tiny part of the um, whole rape issue. Uh, it's the one, of course, which the press, if anybody reads mm. the popular press, it's quite clear that they are the very sort of clear-cut stories that are picked. So to what extent do you think the media is responsible for that, or are they merely reflecting fairly well-held views in society so that it's society as a whole that needs changing? Because it seems to me if you need want to dispel this myth, then you've got to find the key source or sources of the myth. Mm? Well, the, the media obviously bears huge responsibility and is for the most part hugely irresponsible is what I would say. Um, but I do think there is another issue here which is that you have to see rape also within the context of a wider society in which gender disparities of power and resources have long been the norm. In other words, you can't really separate the problem of rape with the, the if you like, a sort of systems of uh, ideas of gender and the way in which they are translated to young 
young children about boys and girls and so on. So, so it's, it's part of the whole sort of gendered ideology, really. Mm. And you can't just pick out rape. You've got to look at the whole thing. Okay, I mean, uh, you raise an interesting point. I mean, when you say do away with the term completely, I mean, both Martin and Rosamond, do you think that rape ought to be seen as a very... Um, a terrible aspect of gender-based violence, really. It's just a form of violence against women. It's of a sexual nature. But um, to take it out of the realms of sex sexuality and put it more in the realms of actual violence against females. Yes, I'd certainly take it out of the realms of sexuality. There is nothing about rape which is anything other than violence, not necessarily physical violence, but there is always mental violence in rape and power <coughs> and abuse um, and to suggest that that has got anything in common with a loving consensual sexual relationship is uh, abhorrent to all of us I would suggest. So do you change it now to, uh, I mean do you see it, do you have to just head up your your division at the, at the Met as uh, gender-based violence really uh, and not categorise it as rape? I think, um, I think calling it violence. So, so most of the frameworks within which we look at this will be violence against women and girls. It won't mention anything sexual. Because in the context, and if you take one of the group, one of the areas that I spoke about, the sort of domestic violence setting, well, this will be one aspect of violence, psychological, physical, the whole range. I don't, th I set the points entirely about rape against women and obviously with today's event, but We've just got to be a little careful around the gender because there is an increasing rate. Oh, yeah, the males. In the yeah, male of side. course, so and that is... That, no, no, I, I agree. But Huge I and think unreported. Yes, and, yes. And, and men, yes. when you think of all the dangers and difficulties that women have about reporting rape, mm. it's far worse for a man who is raped. But, so for me, I think seeing it very clearly as an act of violence is, is a much better way of viewing that. And I do think you have to play that in, and Joanne's point about how do we change people's and stop this, this sort of passing down of how it is, is probably being, I think, even exacerbated. And one of the issues for me, and why I specifically mentioned about boys and the education of boys, I think boys are in a different place now at that sort of early teens in terms of particularly their access to pornography mm -hmm. and therefore... Um, the image that that portrays to them of what mm. relationships in inverted commas, what sex, what, what girls are. And, and we need to really get in and do something about, because when you add that to the, the, the already existing views, you start to get to quite a bad place. No, I couldn't, I, I'm glad you raised that, because I mean, I, I'm the mother of four children, four teenagers, two sons and two daughters, and it does, it, it's a huge area of concern, the fact that they do have access to, you know, I don't know my children themselves, but you know, you know, and on university campuses, I mean, you're finding an increasing incidence of anal fissures amongst yeah. young women, because the boys think, that's what you're supposed to do. And, and I think also, sorry, Jerome, but the, and I think also it is affecting the behaviour of girls as well. Yes, uh, yes. And it's not, so they think it's the normal. They think it's more normal. It's normalising mm. something. Yeah. I'd like to speak to the issue of rape as violence versus rape mm -hmm. as sex, though. I don't think you can take sex out of the equation and simply reduce rape to a crime of violence. One of the difficulties that women who have been raped but where there's no visible signs of violence have yeah. is that people don't seri take seriously that some kind of harm has occurred. There is something very specifically sexual about rape in the sense that after you've been raped, it affects your sexual identity. You're unable to interact with and have it damages you sexually. Absolutely. Um, and therefore, you, you, you uh, and, and there's something quite distinct about one's ability to interact sexually, which is different from one's physical integrity and harm. Being beaten up is not the same as being raped, no. although they're both very bad. That's interesting. It's a very interesting debate. I wanted to ask yeah. you, Rosamond, then, to what extent do you find that the offenders, of uh, perpetrators of serious sexual offences, are violent in other ways against their victims, or is it just usually it manifests itself just in, in the, the sexual way, rape? There is no hard and fast rule, and every rape and every rapist is different, and, and one has to keep that at the core of, of one's thinking. But if a person doesn't think in terms of other people as feeling, sentient, 
warm, responsive human beings, but thinks of them as objects, sexual objects perhaps, but as mm. objects, mm. then they will deal with them and don't think in the way that they would deal with an object. They will hurt them, they will hit them, they will subject them to the most dreadful, degrading, horrible uh, actions. That is not the, the norm of, mm. of rape. Most, wrong, uh, m most rapes do cause long-term harm, but they do not necessarily have the extremes of violence that I've just referred to. And Martin raised the fact that 70% of what, what you believe are sexual offences and rapes go unreported uh, because a large number of the perpetrators are known to the victim and they may even be a partner or a boyfriend or a husband indeed. How high is the bar set for marital rape, Rosamond, in court? Well, it comes as a bit of a surprise to us perhaps to know that before 1991, marital rape did not exist. And marital rape is common. It is commonly unreported. And uh, there is all the difference in the world between a relationship where the wife isn't really up for sex, but the husband wants sex, and so the wife will say, OK, and will have sex and agrees to it, not particularly uh, um, keen, but will have sex with her husband. And another type of, of situation where the husband is insisting on rape and she is submitting to sexual intercourse with him. Submission is not consent. Mm. And uh, how far can cohabiting partners use marital rape? It's not just to those who are legally married, uh, 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 what are often called common law wives. Can they yes. use that? <laughs> No such thing exists. No, I know. I just use it as a shorthand. But do cohabiting partners, can, can the women constant, use that? Constantly. It is they part, can. It is part okay. of an abusive relationship, and sex is part of that Oh, good. So they can. Marital rape does this fall within that. Just one final, I'm sure you've all got questions, and I mustn't hog it here, but... Um, um, Martin, in terms of those cases that do go unreported, obviously London, many ethnic minorities mm -hmm. here and so on, to what extent do you think that you are able to identify the communities here in London where there may be the highest prevalence of unreported sexual offences? I mean, I don't, I don't think I could, I could identify them clearly. I mean, I, we, can clearly, we can identify the communities where all of those kind of cultural issues are, are more prevalent than, than uh, in the sort of indigenous community. Um, and there are clearly places where the norms move, move it completely. But what we do as part of our work is trying to reach out to as many obviously identifiable groups. But, but if you think of all the challenges that we've talked about for a white British person to come forward and report this, and then you add on all the additional challenges of you know, concerns about how you might communicate, concerns mm. about your status in the cut and all the rest, it doesn't lead you to much reporting, I think, is the issue. So, so you think really there's a greater reticence I, amongst, say, uh, the Bengali, I would British imagine, Bengali community I would imagine, in East End? And if you, if you think that, and it comes back to the point that Joanne made about these, these kind of messages and, and beliefs that are passed down, one of the bits that was largely unreported in the stats when they came out recently was about the reasons why somebody didn't report. Mm. And often that was the normal sort of feeling ashamed, feeling in some way a degree of culpability, but a lot of I won't be taken seriously, it's not really important enough, and those kind of things. And if you imagine in some of the contexts in which women exist in, in other cultures, the concept of then coming forward and overcoming all those other barriers and the existing barriers about reporting get quite challenging, I think. And it's, but it's very, it's, we do everything we can and then using support groups because that's often a route into us. It's not direct to us, but it'll be via some other mm. group that are supporting. Well, I think we have all contributed in a small way to trying to change the debate on rape and the fact that so much of that debate is on fixed views and ideologies which we have to try and dispel in order to um, prevent and uh, make sure that rapes, uh, rapists are um, brought to justice. Martin, Joanne and Rosamond, thank you all very much indeed for your very powerful uh, presentations and your questions and answers. Audience, thank you for listening to us. Thank you. Thanks.